Muhammad, the prophet of Muslims, was a man who changed the course of history. He was an ambitious prophet, a leader, and a reformer. He was also a husband, a lover, and a lady killer. He officially married 10 to 15 women according to different historical sources and established intimate bonds with various concubines in his lifetime, each with her own story and role in his life. Muhammad violated the law of maximum four wives that we talked about in the last episode of the series Controversial Verses of Quran. Why did he do that? Was he an exception? Were they just love affairs or were there other motives behind his marriages? How did he manage his relationships with his wives? And how did they affect his mission? What can we learn from his example and what can we criticize? In this series of videos, we will accurately analyze the historic events and the related Quranic verses in details to answer all these questions. We will explore the controversial aspects of his marriages and the impact they had on his followers and his enemies. We will invite you to question, to reflect and to understand. Join us as we uncover the dramatic stories of Muhammad and his wives, a tale of love, war and politics. Khadija was the first and the most beloved wife, a wealthy widow who hired Muhammad as a business agent and later proposed to him because of his trustworthiness. She was almost 40 years old when they got married, while Muhammad was only 25. She supported him when he received his first revelations and was the first person to accept Islam. She died in 619 CE after 25 years of marriage. Muhammad loved her deeply remained faithful to her until her death. She was the only wife who enjoyed Muhammad's company monogamously or without presence of any other wife or concubine. Some mean critics of Muhammad mentioned that the only reason he stayed monogamous with Khadija was because of her status and that who would jeopardize his relationship with a sugar mommy who provides for his living. Don't judge Muhammad like that, please. You make the Muslims all over the world go nuts. Nevertheless, Muhammad often praised her and remembered her with fondness, even in presence of his other wives. Right after Khadija's death, in the same year, Muhammad marries Sauda, and then a bit later Aisha, to console himself. They were both introduced to Muhammad by a woman who was one of the relatives of Uthman, the future third caliph of Islam, and Muhammad agreed to marry both of them consecutively in 619 and 620 CE. Sauda was a 50-year-old widow with a few children, and apparently Muhammad married her with the purpose of providing for her and her orphans, as she also gave up her turn of spending nights with Muhammad to Aisha, who was much younger and more beloved to him, telling her, I'm not like you. I do not seek anything but good from the messenger of God. Aisha, on the other hand, was only six years old at the time she was engaged to Muhammad, and the marriage was consummated when she was nine years old, when Muhammad was 53. Aisha was perhaps the most influential and competitive wife, being the daughter of Abu Bakr, one of the Muhammad's closest companions, and the first caliph after him. Before marrying his fourth official wife, three years later, Muhammad manages to establish an intimacy with one of their family maids who used to nurse him when he was a kid. Umm Ayman was a 55-year-old Abyssinian slave when she became his very first concubine in 623 CE. In 625 CE, the same woman who arranged the previous two marriages, introduced Hafsa, who was the fourth official wife and the most temperamental. She was the daughter of Umar, another close companion of Muhammad, and the second caliph after Abu Bakr. She was a widow of a martyr who had died in the Battle of Bad, but she was about 18 years old when she married Muhammad. She was entrusted with the first copy of the Quran, that was compiled after his death. 
we can consider the marriages with Hafsa and Aisha as the ones with the incentive of tightening the diplomatic ties of Muhammad with the two most influential figures of Islam who were their fathers. Even though Hafsa and Aisha were both young and probably pretty, critics may argue that Omar and Abu Bakr were already two of the closest companions of Muhammad who devoutly supported Islam. However, why don't we look at the other side of the coin? It's quite possible that Abu Bakr and Omar were trying to create a closer bond to Muhammad, who was the head of a political system, by offering their daughters to him through Uthman's relative. This assumption and deduction proves stronger when we realize that they both became caliphs of Islam after Muhammad. A bit after his marriage with Hafsa, Muhammad married two other women who had been widowed by the battles of Uhud and Badr between 625 and 627 CE. Their names were Zainab bint Khuzayma and Umm Salama or mother of Salama. In 627, Muhammad established two more conjugal relationships, one with his cousin and one with a captive of war from a Jewish tribe of Medina. Their names were respectively Zainab bin Jash and Juwairia, and both marriages were eventful. His seventh wife was Zainab, daughter of Jash, his cousin, and the former wife of his adopted son, Zayd ibn Haritha. Zayd was initially a slave that was gifted to Muhammad as a wedding present when he married his first wife, Khadija. Around 625, Muhammad proposed Zainab to marry Zayd. Zainab at first refused the proposal on the grounds that I'm a widow of the Quraysh. She presumably implied that her social status was too high to allow her to marry an ex-slave. Quraysh was the name of the tribe of Muhammad and his relatives that historically inhabited and controlled the city of Mecca and its Kaaba. Muhammad successfully convinced Zainab to accept his proposal by telling her that it was God's will and that by default everyone is equal in the sight of God and Islam. In fact, according to many Islamic clerics, the 36th verse of the chapter Al Ahzab is about God commanding this marriage. A faithful man or woman may not have any option in their matter when God and his apostle have decided on a matter, and whoever disobeys God and his apostle has certainly strayed into manifest error. Muhammad also gave Zainab a generous dowry of 400 dirhams, which was so high at the time. This act of Muhammad has been seen by many as one of his efforts to break the social or tribal casting that was so rigidly common before Islam among Arabs. However, the marriage was not happy and harmonious. Zainab and Zayd did not get along well and often quarreled. Zainab looked down on Zayd as a former slave and reminded him of his humble origin. Zayd complained to Muhammad about his wife's arrogance and asked for his permission to divorce her. Muhammad advised him to keep his wife and fear God. According to the history book of Tabari, Muhammad came to visit Zayd one day but did not find him at home. Instead, he caught a glimpse of Zainab who was not fully dressed. The Prophet was struck by her beauty and fell in love with her immediately. When Zayd returned home, Zainab told him what had happened. He went to Muhammad and offered to divorce Zainab so that the Prophet could marry her. Muhammad declined, but Zayd, who could not tolerate his arrogant and ambitious wife, divorced her anyway. Perhaps concerned about the future of his divorced cousin and feeling responsibility for setting up an unsuccessful marriage, Muhammad was also distressed about the propriety of marrying Zayd's former wife. His marriage to Zainab could cause controversy as it violated the pre-Islamic custom of not marrying the ex-wife of one's son. However, Muhammad received a revelation in the 37th verse of the chapter Al-Ahzab, confirming that it was legitimate for Muslim men to marry the wives of their adopted sons after they divorced them.
when you told him whom God had blessed and whom you had blessed, retain your wife for yourself and be wary of God. And you had hidden in your heart what God was to divulge. And you feared the people, though God is worthier to be feared. Therefore, when Zaid had got through with her, we wedded her to you, so that there may be no blame on the faithful in respect of the wives of their adopted sons. When the former has got through with them, and God's command was always done. Zainab was about 30 years old when she married Muhammad. She had no children with him, but she was proud of being chosen by God for Muhammad and often boasted about it to his other wives. Some apologists of Islam argue that this marriage was a symbol to eliminate another bad custom of pre-Islamic period. As a result, they claim that there was no essence of love and desire in this marriage. I'm not sure how harmful or unpleasant this custom was, or how necessary it was to break it by such a controversial marriage, but I'll let you be the judge of that. Let me know in the comments what you think the reason for this marriage was. In the case of Jawairia, whose husband was killed in the battle, she initially became the share of one of Muhammad's companions, Thabit son of Qais. According to one of the verses of the Quran, Muslim men can take the guardianship of captive women even if they have or had a husband. Surah An Nisa, verse 24. And it is also forbidden to you, the married women, except those who come under your control. This verse has been abused by the extremist group ISIS, who used it as a justification for enslaving and sexually exploiting thousands of women from Syria and Iraq. These women were sold in markets and forced to endure unimaginable horrors at the hands of their captors. Jawaria then asked Thabit to free her, but he set a very high ransom. Jawaria was a beautiful and noble woman who did not accept her fate as a slave. She asked Thabit to take her to Muhammad, hoping that he would help her. Thabit agreed and brought her to Muhammad's tent. Jawaria pleaded with Muhammad to free her and her tribe saying that she was the daughter of a chieftain and used to command respect and dignity. Muhammad was moved by her words and her situation and probably her beauty. He offered to marry her and free her from Thabit's bondage. He also said that by marrying her, he would free all the captives of her tribe as they would become his relatives by their marriage. Jawaria agreed to his proposal and became his eighth wife at 20 years of age. About this incident, Aisha said, I saw her, and I knew that the messenger would see in her what I had seen. She was a pleasant woman. No one saw her except he became captivated by her. I do not know a woman who was a greater blessing to a people than she. However, Rehana, another female Jewish captive of Muslims, did not have the same happy ending. She was about 15 years old when she became Muhammad's concubine, but since she refused to convert to Islam and remained a Jew, she remained a maid until her death and didn't become Muhammad's official wife. Some historians have categorized the marriage with Jawaria as one of the political ones, as it helped to strengthen the Muslim community and expand its influence in Arabia. Jawaria's tribe later fought alongside Muhammad in several battles, such as the Battle of Khaybar and the conquest of Mecca. Muhammad's marriage with Jawaria has been criticized by some as a lustful and opportunistic act, exploiting her status as a captive of war. They have also pointed out the contrast between his treatment of Jawaria and that of Rehana, who was kept as either a concubine or a slave and that they have argued that this demonstrates his inconsistency and hypocrisy in his dealings with women. Furthermore, they have pointed out that most or all of Rehana's tribe members remained as slaves or maids according to many Islamic historical sources unless they converted to Islam. Therefore, they have argued that Muhammad did not establish a universal system to abolish slavery without any conditions. 
They have also noted that Muhammad often made the acceptance of Islam a prerequisite for marrying his female captives or freeing slaves in general. The apologists of Muhammad have defended his marriage with Jawaria as a noble act of compassion and mercy, which elevated her status and dignity as a woman and a believer. They have also explained that this decision to marry or not marry a captive was based on the various factors such as her consent, her faith, her family ties, her personal preference, and his own needs and circumstances. They have asserted that he treated all his wives and concubines with justice and respect, regardless of their origin or background. I will more closely examine this last claim according to historic sources and Quranic verses in the next clips of this series. We should also remember that Muhammad was not only a simple saint, but also a clever politician as the leader of an institutional system of thought that was trying to grow and unify the Arabian Peninsula, which it eventually did for the first time in the ancient history of Arabia. Thank you for joining me on this clip so far. I'm gonna finish this clip with a nice quote about women from Muhammad. But before that, I hope you enjoyed learning about the dramatic stories of Muhammad and his wives. In the next episode, I'll narrate the drama that arose among the wives of Muhammad as he continued marrying more women until his death. You'll hear how Hafsa cut the prophet with a concubine in her room and how he dealt with the consequences. Don't forget to do all that good stuff like share and subscribe. And let me know in the comments what you think about the Muhammad's conjugal relationships. See you soon. Beware of exotic women raised in wickedness, for they are like flowers grown on manure.